and not only Roald Amundsen, but also Brewer Heyerdahl spoke here at the club. So these are all great explorers uh, who are interested in the topic that I'm going to talk to you about tonight, especially Stuart Heyerdahl, especially was. But uh, yeah, go back just two more slides. So there's my book, uh, The Norwegian Club. Okay, so this is where I talk about the fact that Tour Heyerdahl spoke here. And Tour Heyerdahl, of course, took the Khan Tiki across the oceans. He had a theory that there was contact across the oceans before the history says that there was. Uh, so next slide, please. So what I talk about is a little bit like a mystery story. If you think of any mystery story that you've ever seen, whether it's Sherlock Holmes or Scooby-Doo, they're an outsider that's coming in. Typically, the authorities have already got this idea in their head. Like when Sherlock Holmes shows up, Scotland Yard isn't usually too happy to see Sherlock Holmes show up because he's going to come in with a different angle. The authorities have their story, and then these kind of outsiders say, wait a minute, there's some clues here that don't seem to fit the official story. And my book is actually about the ancient history of mankind, and I think that the story that we're taught in school, that there's no connection, for instance, between these different civilizations, there's a lot of clues, there's a lot of evidence out there that doesn't fit the story. And that's why you've got a large community of people who say, who, who have all these alternative theories. And so why do they have those theories? Because there's a lot of evidence that doesn't fit the official theory. So my book, The Matheson Corollary, is a it's an addition to this conversation, and it talks about the possibility, the evidence that there was a global flood, a global flood, and that there was connecting the geological clues from that to the evidence for some of these ancient civilizations that don't fit in with the regular story. So if you could go ahead to the next slide, Mount Ola. Does anyone know what this picture is here? This is from a a child storybook that my parents got me when I was a kid. Thank you, Dad. I think it's a great, great book to get for your kids or grandkids. Somebody said it, I heard it. That's Valhalla right there. I don't know who this character is right here. There's a Odin, right? He only has one eye. He's holding up a meat glass there. They're scolding, obviously. The long table. And it's like them. they all fell in battle. They're all dead. So they're different. It's not the Norwegian club, right? <laughs> but it's a long haul, hospitality. All they do all day is battle, right? Here's a new recruit coming in, a new member, right? He's a he's a guest, but he's coming in. But, but who are these that bring the new recruits in? The Valkyries. They got to fall in battle, and then you get to basically fight all day and party all night if you're in Valhalla. But they're getting ready for what? The last battle. They're getting ready for the end of the world, which is called Ragnarok. Ragnarok, right? And um, does anyone know how many gates there were in Valhalla? Hundreds of gates. And it says right here, this is from actually from the from the poetic Edda. From the poetic Edda. And a portion is called the Grimnismal. The Grimnismal means the Mal, the same. The Grim, this is one of the disguises of Odin. He's in disguise and he's saying some mystic sayings, and he says, 500 gates and 40 more are in the mighty building of Valhalla. 800 fighters through each door fare when to war with the wolf. They go, that's Fenris wolf. At the end of the world, the gods are going to battle, and the, the Fenris wolf and the Midgard serpent are going to battle against Odin and Thor. And um, it's very interesting because 540 times 800 fighters, that tells us how many members there were in the Valhalla Club, right? How many? 540 times 800. Okay, next slide. It's 432,000. 432,000. So what's really interesting, I come to people say, well, Dave, where are you coming at this from? I, I have an English literature background. English literature obviously looks at a lot of mythology. There's a lot of mythology in literature. The connections in the mythologies around the world are amazing. 
And the conventional theory says, oh, uh, you know, they just all happen to arise by coincidence. You know, we have we, we have a world tree in Norse mythology, and then we have a world vine in um, a Pacific island. That's just a coincidence. They just happen to come up with the same idea. Well, I think some of these numbers, maybe you'll agree, maybe you won't agree with me, maybe you will at the end. And I'm, I'm just going to show a little bit of stuff here, not very much. But this number, 432,000, is not a coincidental number. It's a very significant number. In fact, the sides of the Great Pyramid, they're about 756 feet per side. This is a diagram from somebody who surveyed it back in the early 1900s with the, the auto light back before they had GPSs. If you, um, if you divide that by the size, the researchers think a royal cubit was 21 inches. Well, that works out to 432 royal cubits. That's interesting. Another thing that's interesting about the Great Pyramid, you may have heard this. I'm, I'm not the one who discovered this. People have written about this. If you add up all the sides, the base perimeter comes to 3,023 feet. If you multiply that number by 43,200, you come up with this, a very close approximation of the circumference of the spherical Earth. The Earth itself is 131 million feet at the equator. There's 130.6. It's within 0.75%, less than 1% error. Um, and you could say, well, okay, you just came up with a number. I mean, we could come up with any building, multiply it by some number, get the circumference of the Earth. But the fact that it uses a significant number, 43,200, which is found in a lot of other mythologies, and you'll see that this number has astronomical significance as well. We'll just touch on it really briefly. Leads me to conclude that it's not, not coincidental. Let's go to the next slide. Just to show you, here's um, something from the Vedas. The Vedas are obviously from Hindu, ancient Hindu from India. The, the Rig Veda, which is before 1100 BC, traditionally is known to have had 432,000 syllables. You can look it up. They say, well, it had 10,800 stanzas. Each stanza, 40 syllables. 40 times 10,800, you can see that's going to be 4. 8 times 4, 32. 432,000 syllables. You say, okay, Dave, that's interesting, but so what? So we're going to next slide. Actually, it shows that way, way, way back, before, I mean, these things are 1100 BC for the Rig Veda, the pyramid, at least 2600 BC. Some people think it may be older, including I think it may be older. But these are actually, these numbers here that I put over here are related to an actual astronomical phenomenon, sophisticated scientific phenomenon. It's not, this isn't mythology, this is real astronomy. When the Earth goes around the Sun, we can imagine, you know, if this room were the Earth's orbit as we went around, and, and all along the walls there were constellations, and on the ceiling there were constellations. As you go around the sun, you, you're not able to see the constellations in the direction of the sun, right? As we're going around, you know, there's the sun, you can't see them. But if you're looking at night, off that way, so when we got around to this portion, we'd see King Pekong, or we'd see King Olaf, or we'd see, you know, the different constellations, of course, would be like Orion, or the different constellations. But when we got to here, on, say, March 21st, when we're looking off that way, we see the portrait of King Olaf. But when we came all the way around here, over, over here to where Idar is sitting, obviously we couldn't see any constellations that way, but we'd look off that way in space and we'd see, oh, there's the Viking ship. Okay? And as we go around, we should see the same constellations on the same day every year. Like when we get to March 21st, we should always be in front of the king. When we get to September 22nd over here, we should always be in front of the Viking ship. But actually, over time, we don't see the same one every... And, and the reason is because the Earth actually wobbles. It's called precession. And so it changes what we see very slowly. It's, a, it's not that complicated, but most people don't think about it every day. But actually, it takes 72 years for the constellations to shift one degree. So that number 72 is an important astronomical number. And it's encoded in ancient myths, like the number of, like Osiris in Egypt was ambushed by his brother Set and 72 henchmen that helped him out. And we see this number 72 over and over. And 72, 
432 is a factor of 432. So these same numbers pop up over and over in mythology all around the world. And you say, wow, maybe there was a connection. So the conventional theory says, no, there's no connection. Sherlock Holmes or Scooby-Doo might say, wait a minute, there's some clues here that you're not looking at. I think maybe there was a connection. Maybe there was people, some ancient civilization that, that, that was either a predecessor of all these civilizations and they're all remembering it in their mythologies, or there was connections between the continents. I'll show you some more evidence for that as we go along. 